Good morning. Today um, is a very awesome Sabbath here in, in Cooper. You know, Charlie and Lori have been working very hard at um, preparing our baptismal tank. You know, we have a small church, but we have a lot of love. And, uh, um, you know, they sanded this thing down and, you know, they stained it and it looks, it looks very beautiful. And I'm just so glad we get to use it today for, for Peyton and for Mike. Um, they have decided to give their life over to Jesus Christ. And it's just such an awesome adventure that they're going to be taking on. You know, to accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior and to follow him through thick and thin. You know, it doesn't mean that their life will always be easy. It doesn't mean that their life will always be perfect. But what it means is that they're going to trust Jesus to carry them through through those difficult times. They're going to trust Jesus when Jesus makes them soar on eagles' wings. So I want to ask Peyton to come out here. She's going to be uh, the first one to get baptized. And um, I can't remember how old you are, Peyton. Are you 12? 11 years old and uh, it's just been so awesome to be able to see Peyton growing and stuff and uh, uh, I don't know she she brought her friend I can't remember your name either Kaylin <laughs> and I remember one of the awesome uh, times that we had together was uh, with uh, Sammy's parents doing the the roundup and stuff and here were these little girls I don't know nine or ten years old riding around on horseback as they were herding cattle together but what is really special today is that it's her grandpa who's going to baptize her. You know, her grandpa who has done the Bible studies with her, her grandpa who has been with her through thick and thin, and I mean, there's just so much love in Charlie's heart. And um, he's done the studies, and I said, you know what, Charlie, you should be the one who, who baptizes her. So go ahead and, and step in, Charlie. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> go ahead and step in, Peyton. <laughs> you got it? Uh, now what I'm wanting to tell y'all is Peyton's faith has been strong all these, all these years we were going to uh, Walmart one night and uh, it, started, it started raining and Peyton said well I just pray that it stopped nearly immediately it stopped I mean, the faith, the faith has always been there. And, uh, I, but I'm just blessed to have her as a, as a grand, grand, grandchild. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I'm going to say a prayer first. Uh, our dear Heavenly Father, I just want you to bless this little girl. Have the Holy Spirit come into her life, mold her character, bless her in, in the many things that she tries to accomplish in this life, help her to witness to the people that she needs to, and open up her, her life and in, in where she can witness and show the character that you're building in this girl to, to further your kingdom. For we're asking in Jesus' name, amen. Peyton, in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I baptize you today. Amen. You're all right. You're all right. <laughs> I want to ask Mike now to come up here and this is Mike King. I met Mike, you know, when we first came to this church and Mike has always been very talkative. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. I think he's the shyest person I know in the world. <laughs> but he's awesome to have conversations with. You know, and as I've gotten to know Mike and, and talk with him, there's no doubt in my mind that he loves Jesus Christ. There's no doubt in my mind that he has accepted him as his Lord and Savior. And he wants to give his life over to God. And uh, so that's what he's doing here today. I invite you to bow your heads with me as I have a prayer for him. 
Dearly Father, Lord, I want to thank you so much for my King. Lord, a man who loves you, who wants to follow Jesus Christ, Lord. Lord, I ask that you bless him as a man, as a father, as a son, as an uncle. Lord, may he have a double portion of your Holy Spirit. Lord, and as he walks with you, Lord, may you show him your amazing love for him. May you give him the strength, Lord, to carry on even when life gets difficult. May, we, may he always carry that smile with him. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Mike is the minister of the gospel. I baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It's, uh, it's an amazing thing when someone decides to give their life over to Jesus Christ. Today we're going to be going over, over faith. That's what it is to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus doesn't mean that it's always going to be easy. To follow Jesus doesn't mean that we're going to be able to walk on a smooth, paved road for the rest of our lives. Oswald Chambers says this. This is how he describes faith. He says, Faith for my deliverance is not faith in God. Faith means whether I am visibly delivered or not, I will stick to my belief that God is love. There are some things only learned in a fiery furnace. Let's bow our heads for another word of prayer. The only follower, we're so grateful for Jesus. Lord, for his love, for his compassion, but for the fact that when we accept him, he gives us eternal life. Lord, at this moment, we invite you to be with us. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. It's interesting that he says that sometimes faith is best seen from a fiery furnace. You know, we talk about faith and it is true. You know, as a child, we always, for some reason, seem to have more faith than, than adults. I remember when I was a child, I was burning up with fever one time. And um, <clears throat> I was a, the sickly child of the, of the home. And I mean, sometimes it would get so bad that I'd, I'd start hallucinating and seeing things that weren't there. And I remember one time I told my mom, let's pray. You know, I was probably in first grade and I could tell she had, I could see the fear in her eyes. And we prayed and instantly that, that, that fever broke. And it's just, it's so beautiful when you see the faith of a child. And for some reason, the, the more we grow, the <laughs> almost the more we learn about God sometimes, the more we complicate our faith. And it shouldn't be that way. There's a passage in the book of Mark, and it's also found in, in Matthew. And I'm going to read it out of Matthew. And this is what it says. And Jesus went out from, the, from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from the region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away. For she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. You know, it's so complicated this this passage you know when you first read it it almost seems like jesus has has been having a bad day you know here's this woman she's from another country she's a gentile she's got some greek in her and she's got some canaanite in her and if you remember the canaanites were the people that joshua sent in essentially to demolish god had told them go into the land of canaan and conquer it and in many passages they didn't leave anybody alive the reason was because the Canaanites were such evil, wicked people. They worshipped other gods. They did human sacrifices. And it was just, as a matter of fact, the reason that the other ten tribes of Israel were done away with is because of the influence that the Canaanites had on them. That's where this woman came from. This woman came from that past. 
Her race was that of, evil, of uh, idol worshipers, of evildoers. But not just that, she also had some Greek in her. <laughs> when Alexander the Great conquered the known world and had conquered the land of Israel or the land of Palestine, you know, soldiers would go in there and they just intermingled with people and she had some of that in her. Now the Jews were very, very proud people. They were extremely proud and even racist. To them, they thought that they were the chosen people and they were the chosen people. But the problem was that they thought that they were so special that, that no one else should be able to even associate with them. No one else should be able to even come close to them. And it was a sad thing. You know, I'll be honest with you all. When I first came to East Texas, I was a little bit worried because I'm Mexican. And um, there's unfortunately, there's still some people who don't who aren't very open-minded and still have some racist thoughts. As a matter of fact, when, when Anne and I were first married, we took a road trip up to Colorado, and I have the bad habit of uh, stopping along the way if I see a vehicle that I like, and I'll ask if they're interested in selling it. It doesn't matter if there's a for sale sign or not. I'm going to ask if it's for sale. You'll be surprised how many vehicles I've bought that way. <laughs> so I saw this Jeep. It was a CJ7. It was kind of like a goldish brown color, and I was like, man, it's... It's perfect. It's lifted. It's got 35-inch tires. That's, I'm going to go ahead and ask about it. So I got down out of the car, and I told Anne, I was like, I'll be right back. I'm going to go ask about that Jeep. And I went in and knocked on the door, and this gentleman came out. And I told him, I was like, hey, sir, I'm, I'm uh, interested in, uh, in uh, your Jeep. I don't know if you'd be interested in selling it. And he said to me, he's like, it's a good thing, and I'm going to use more polite words. He says, it's a good thing you're not African-American. Or Mexican, because I would have shot you. I praise the Lord, I got a little bit of Korean in me. <laughs> so I think that's what threw him off. My eyes are a little bit more slanted. And it was scary. My legs started to tremble, and I played it off pretty well. But it's sad that we live in this world. But it's even more sad when the people of God have that attitude towards others. And that is what's going on here. And you're going to see how close that was, how evil it was, that... The Jews, they wouldn't even hang out with the Samaritans. And there was some sort of similarity between the Samaritans and the nation of Judah. But here, these people had nothing to do with the Jews. Now, this woman, it says that this woman came out of nowhere, essentially. Now, Jesus, at that point in time, had become so popular. People had heard that he had fed thousands of people, not just one time, twice, out of tiny little lunch sacks. People had heard that Jesus had walked on water. People had heard that Jesus had calmed the seas and the winds, that he was able to cast out demons, that he was able to stump the rabbis and the religious leaders, that he always had the right answer to give. But what impressed this woman the most was the fact that Jesus wasn't afraid to meet sin face to face, that Jesus wasn't afraid to touch someone with love. To a person who was leprous, he wasn't afraid to put his hand on them, to bring them healing and comfort. What inspired this woman to come to Jesus is that she knew and she had heard that Jesus didn't discriminate and that Jesus was so filled with love that he wouldn't push her away. So this woman hears that Jesus, this new rabbi, this young man is coming around and it's way out of the way. And she, he, he's walking with the disciples and you can just imagine the disciples walking in territory that's not theirs, you know. Nose up high, don't look around because you might get dirty type of deal. And this woman starts calling out. What does she start saying? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now this isn't a quiet thing. This isn't a text message that she sends out. She's screaming it out. She's in so much distress. She is so pressured by the fact that her child is suffering. By an evil spirit, she's crying out to Jesus, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. It's interesting because she obviously knew something about the Messiah. She obviously knew th something about God, knowing that the Messiah would come from the lineage of David. So she's crying out to Jesus. She's in anguish. She's stressed out. She needs help. She's desperate. You know, being a Canaanite woman, I imagine that she probably had gone to her other gods. She probably had... I don't know if she, they still had Bella at that point in time, but she had tried everything else and nothing had worked for her until she found out Jesus was coming by. And she's crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
And now the disciples, they're already, like I said, they're already on the wrong side of the tracks. They already don't like the fact that Jesus has brought them way out of the way for no apparent reason. And they're here amongst the, the dirty people, the unclean, the Gentiles, the heathens. And what does Jesus do? It says that Jesus continues to walk. In my mind, what I imagine happening is this woman is coming after them, behind them, you know, just crying out. She needs help. And as she's crying out, I imagine, in my mind's eye, that Jesus begins to walk faster. Walk faster, walk faster, pretend like you don't hear. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. That's how I imagine it. And as Jesus is walking faster, I imagine the disciples, the disciples probably got a little bit happy. Well, this is a first. Jesus never walks away fast from someone. And what do they do? Oh, Lord. You know, I imagine Peter probably came up to the front of the line. Lord, send her away. Look at the commotion she's making. Look at everything, the, the, the attention she's attracting. And what does Jesus do? This is why I say, you know, when I first read this passage, I was like, man, Jesus must have been having a bad day. Hold on, my pages got flipped there. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and urged her, saying, urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. And he answered, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Those are some hard words. Those are some hard words. I was not sent except for the lost sheep of Israel. Now, the disciples didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. I don't know if this woman understood what he was talking about. Really what that verse says is this. I was sent to find those that the house of Israel has lost. In other words, I have sent to fix the problem that the house of Israel has caused. In other words, Jesus came to fix what Israel was not willing to fix. The nation of Israel had been set in such a perfect location to be able to pre preach the gospel. You know, just uh, this last week, I have some church members from Paris that opened a little taco stand out in uh, Roxton. And I went over there, you know, just to see what it was about. I don't ever try to pass out a taco. <laughs> and they were good. They were good. They're right in Roxton in the middle of, uh, right by the square there in a little uh, trailer. And they were so good. But I was telling my wife, I was like, you know what? There's not enough traffic in Roxton. If it was me, I told her, I put it out there in Paris by the O'Reilly's or in Sulphur Springs, somewhere where there's a lot of traffic. Jesus or God put the nation of Israel at the crossroads of the world. Everyone from the world, there was a perfect trading route. God placed them there to be able to proclaim the gospel that there is a God, the creator of heaven and earth. But they hadn't done that. People had slipped through the cracks. and The, the other nations around them, the, they hadn't been told about God's love. They had kept it to themselves. That's why Jesus says here, I was sent to rescue those. In other words, I was sent to rescue the sheep that Israel has pushed away. Or I was sent to rescue the sheep that Judah has pushed away. Now imagine when the disciples heard this. I don't know if this happens to you, but sometimes when I hear something, I miss up the words or mix, mix up the words. And I'll hear something that isn't what it really was said. It's almost like your brain picks and chooses the words and rearranges the order. I imagine the disciples probably said, I was sent for the sheep of Israel. And that's probably where they left it. Now this woman, she's persistent. Maybe she might have heard the same thing. She is persistent. And then she says, then she came, in verse 25, then she came and worshipped him saying, Lord, help me. What would you have done? What would you have done? What would you have done if you've heard all these awesome things about a, a loving Savior, a loving rabbi? What would you have done if you have heard all these amazing things that there's this man who has fed thousands of people twice? What would you have done if supposedly this man who is so filled with love has cast out demons, has calmed storms, has, has touched the lepers, but when you come out and you're in desperate situations because your child is ill, and here it says that she was possessed by a demon, that this man continues to not just walk past you, maybe speed up, and then says some words that are hurtful. What would you have done? 
cried? <laughs> yeah. Give him a piece of your mind, maybe. Man. You know, um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, my son Noah got an ear infection. He kept spiking fevers and stuff, and I said, you know what, I'm going to take him to the doctor tomorrow. So I took him into the doctor, and, and he was... <laughs> don't take this the wrong way, but he was super, super sweet. <laughs> when he's sick, he's a good little boy. He just wants you to hold him and wants to hug on you. And when he's his normal self, he's grumpy, and he's going to tell you what he thinks. <laughs> so you know he was sick because he was so calm and just wanted to hold you, and it felt good. I was like, man, can't you just always be this loving? <laughs> can't you always be this cuddly? So I take him into the doctor because he wasn't himself. And the doctor says, yeah, his, his ears are very infected, and one is very bulging and stuff, and it's like, we're going to have to give him some strong antibiotics and give him some shots. Oh, man. I don't know how those nurses can give children shots. I... I, I almost cried, and I didn't get the stinking shots. Here she said, you know, here she is, you know, she's talking very calmly to me, and she's like, all right, you hold his hands, and just get close to him. And she put her, his little legs down, and she kind of pressed up against him, and gave him one shot, and gave him the other shot, and he just looked into my eyes, thinking, asking me with his eyes, why are you allowing this to happen to me? I almost cried. Such a wuss. <laughs> but when your child is sick, you're willing to do anything in your power to save your child, to bring healing to your child, to make your child happy. That's why this woman is so desperate. She continues to press on after Jesus. She continues to search for Jesus. Finally, she catches up to him. After all of her effort, and she falls to his feet and says, Lord, help me. How are we in our Christian walk? And being a Christian isn't easy. To be a Christian, to be baptized like Mike and Peyton, what that means to Satan is that I have lost one. I'm going to do everything I can to get them back on my side. So he's going to come after you. But the question is, what will you do? Will you be a quitter? Or will you continue to press on? You know, when I played football in New York as a freshman, oh, I loved it. Man, it didn't matter if my elbows were bleeding. It didn't matter. I didn't care if it was cold, if I had twisted my ankle. I loved it. Just the stinky smell of the locker room. <laughs> Feeling just the itch from dirt all over the place and stuff. It just felt good. You know, and it's just the coaches, though. You know, Charlie, you told me you played some football. I'm sure that there are some other guys in here maybe who have played some football. The coaches made us do some ridiculous drills. I was thinking to myself, yeah, this is a lot of fun. You know, guys, pretty much anytime you can hit each other, you're having fun. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, and I asked the guys, what is this drill for? How is this going to help us? But we continue to press forward. We continue to press on. You continue to practice and give everything that you have. Because we trusted our coaches. We didn't understand why we had this one drill. It was called the Irish drill. They put a football in the middle, and each guy was set outside five yards from that football. You had to roll, pick up the football, and try to get past the other guy. And, man, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> and they had to hit you as hard as they could. And it was like the more dramatic the hit was, even if you were the one being tackled, everybody would give you a high five. Oh, man, he hit you so hard, your feet went up in the air. <laughs> you know, oh, that was so awesome. I don't know what it is with boys. And just, we're so barbaric, boys. I'm not barbaric anymore. I've been tamed down by my wife. <laughs> But the reason we did these drills, the reason we pushed so hard, the reason we gave everything that we have and left it all on in the field is because we trusted our coaches. It wasn't always easy. The life of a Christian isn't always going to be easy, Mike. The life of a Christian, Peyton, isn't always going to be perfect. There's going to come times in your life where you're going to wonder, you know, what direction should I go in, Lord? What choice should I make here? Am I doing what is right? There will be times in your life, like Oswald said, where your faith will be, will be tested with fire. What in the world were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thinking as they felt the heat of those fiery furnaces coming their way? You remember what they told Nebuchadnezzar? We're not going to bow down. We serve a God that can save us. 
But even if he doesn't deliver us, we want you to know, O king, we will not bow down to your statue. What were they thinking at that moment when they felt the arms of the strong soldiers about to throw them in and they felt that heat come their way? What did Daniel think when they opened up the, the lion's den and his eardrum hurt from the roar of the lions and he smelt that stench? What was he thinking then? What in the world did I decide to do? Why didn't I bow down? Why didn't I shut the window so I could pray in peace? The life of a Christian isn't easy. But when we trust Jesus Christ, when we continue to pursue Him, even when it looks like God isn't listening to us. Have you ever had those situations? Have you ever had those situations when you're on your knees and you're praying and you're begging to the Lord to show you or to answer your prayer request and you feel like God is nowhere and at an earshot away? You feel like God isn't listening to you? That's what this woman was feeling here. But she was persistent. She continued to press forward even when any other man would have said, you know what, forget this. This isn't even worth it. It's not worth me becoming humiliated for this. Lord, help me. So there's something about this woman that we can learn from. She was very persistent. All that she had to keep her pushing forward, she had never seen Jesus. All that she had was a knowledge of the testimony that other people had given to her about what had, Jesus had done. If she would have allowed herself to be based on emotion, if she would have allowed her relationship with God to be based on an emotion, she may have failed. But because of the knowledge of the testimonies that she had heard, she was able to be able to press forward. Lord, help me. She proclaimed Jesus Christ as her Lord. She fell at his feet and begged him for help. She continued to press forward even when it looked like God wasn't listening to her, when Jesus wasn't listening to her. And then this is kind of, in my mind, the hay that would break, the straw that would break the camel's back. Yes. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. That's messed up. <laughs> what would you have done if Jesus would have told you, it's not good for me to take away the miracles that I should be doing in Judah and give them to you? To call her a little dog. What did she do? <laughs> she came back with an awesome remark. She says to him, yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. You talk about a persistent person. You talk about a person who wasn't going to allow anything to stop her from coming to Jesus Christ and making her request known. You talk about a woman who had faith. Even when it seemed like God himself or Jesus himself was against her, she continued to press forward in faith of who Jesus was. You know, so many times, unfortunately, we think that, well, I'm going to ask for something, and if God doesn't give it to me, that's because He doesn't love me. And if He doesn't do what I ask Him to do, then I'm just going to stop believing Him. I'm not going to follow Him anymore. Unfortunately, that's how a lot of us behave. We become shallow Christians where we think to ourselves, I will only follow if He does for me. Is that how it should be? No. Our faith in Jesus Christ, our faith in God should not be based on the things that He does for us. Our faith should be based on who He is. No matter what we are. Our faith should be based on who He is. That's the only thing that kept this woman going forward. The only thing that kept her going forward is that she knew that I've heard this man is good and I'm going to continue to press him even when it seemed like he was against her himself. Not because of miracles. What did the other rabbis and, and Pharisees say? Show us a sign. Jesus had just done a tremendous miracle. What did they say? Show us a sign. <laughs> Our relationship with God should not be based on miracles. Our relationship with God should be based on who He is. And that's it. Even if we don't see a miracle in our life, we should still continue to have faith in who He is. 
Then Jesus answered and said to her. Let me pause here. I hadn't thought about this, but what were the disciples thinking at this point in time? Man, you probably thought, man, Jesus is getting her good. I had no idea Jesus could come up with these, all these, you know, put downs or whatever it may be. Almost like back in the day. Oh, yeah, your mama's so fat. Da, 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 da. That's almost what it would have seemed like here. Jesus was putting this woman down, it seemed like. The disciples were probably like, oh, yeah, hold on, Jesus. Let me get you some other guys. You can put them down, too. They were probably so proud of themselves, so proud of Jesus. They didn't know where it was coming from. But Jesus was doing it to try to teach them a lesson. Then Jesus answered, answered and said to her, O oh woman, he didn't say you are so stubborn. Great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. He didn't say, oh woman, you're getting on my nerves. He didn't say you are so stubborn. He didn't say stop nagging me. He said, great is your faith. I've said this before, but I'm going to share it again. A man who's been in the church for a long time, who's a, he's a religious leader in, in our community. He was afraid to pray too much or he was afraid to ask God for too many things. And it's not because he lacked faith. It's almost like he was timid with his relationship with God. What we can get from this and what I want us to understand is that as a Christian, we need to be persistent. When we walk with him, the answer isn't always going to be, our, the plan God has for our lives isn't always going to be laid out perfectly. There's going to be times in our life where we're going to find roadblocks. The question is, what are you going to do in those roadblocks? What are you going to do when life gets hard? What are you going to do when, when your prayers aren't being answered the way you want it to be answered or even answered at all? What are you going to do when it almost seems like God is, instead of answering the way you want it, going against what you want and giving you the opposite. We do what this woman did. We continue to press on. We continue to have faith in God, no matter what. To conclude, there's this, there's this story that I wanted to share with you all. It says, faith honors God and God honors faith. For 10 years... Robert and Mary Moffat labored faithfully in Buchanaland, which is now called Botswana, without one ray of encouragement to brighten their day. They could not report a single convert. Finally, this is for 10 years. Finally, the directors of the mission board began to question the wisdom of continuing the work. The thought of leaving their post, however, brought great grief to, the, to this devoted couple, for they felt sure that God was in their labors and that they would see people turn to Christ in due season. They stayed for a year or two longer. Darkness reigned. Then one day, a friend in England sent word to the Mofats that she wanted to mail them a gift and ask what they would like. Trusting that in time the Lord would bless their works, Mrs. Mofat replied, Send us a communion set. I am sure that it will soon be needed. God honored that dear woman's faith. The Holy Spirit moved upon the hearts of the villagers and soon a little group of six converts was united to form the first Christian church in that land. The communion set from England was delayed in the mail, but on the very day before the first commemoration of the Lord's Supper in Buchanan land, the set arrived. The life of a Christian isn't always easy. Our faith should be based on who God is, not on what He can do for us on who He is, and He is love. And He always hears our prayer requests. So that's what I want to let Peyton and Mike know. Your, relation, your, your walk with Jesus may not, may not always be easy. But be assured, He is hearing you, and He will always be with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful for the testimony that this woman, Lord, who was considered a Gentile, was able to give. But we're so grateful because she was so persistent she continued to look for you. She continued to run after Jesus Christ. And it was just to show the disciples a lesson. It's to show us a lesson. That as Christians, we should be persistent when we search for you. As Christians, Lord, we may not always have our answers, our prayer requests answered immediately. 
And even at times, Lord, it may even seem like you're working against us. But we will continue to press forward in faith because we know that you are love. Lord, we thank you for everything in Jesus' name. Amen.